So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the balancing authority perspective, because now I want to talk about some of the optimization models that are used to find the dispatch for generators and to find the electricity prices that will be traded on, on those markets. So the, the BAs is the entity responsible for maintaining the balance uh, within its region. So they will control electricity generation, turning generators on and off, determining how much power they can generate. And they also control the power transmission. And they, they control the interconnection with other balancing authorities. But the question we want to focus today is how they balance demand and supply at all times. And the answer is uh, using optimization models. And this is usually used, they usually use a two settlement approach. So we have the day ahead and the real time scheduling. So just to give a perspective of the balancing authorities in the US, we have like three big interconnections and we have a total of 66 balancing authorities. The circle size here is related to the, the BA size. You can see that PJM is the biggest. And uh, just to, to give you an idea, Duke Energy, Carolina's Duke Energy Progress, they are also balancing authorities. So uh, the, the other uh, agents that we mentioned before are the RTOs or the ISOs that are regulated by FERC. So I also wanted to give you a perspective of RTOs in the US. We have seven RTOs. They don't own any of the transmission or generation assets. They basically just operate them. And the white non-RTO regions are served by the individual utilities that are regulated by the public utility commissions. So the RTOs will serve the balancing function in their territories. So for territories where we have a vertically integrated utility, how is, uh, how is the process? So they look ahead and schedule or commit units to meet demand and ensure the reliability. Closer to the time of delivery, they will adjust the commitment to contingencies and changes in demand. Because remember on, on number one, they are looking ahead. So they're looking at the projected demand. And in real time, they will balance demand and supply, making further adjustments to dispatch. From a market operator perspective, they will run a day ahead market and commit units for every hour of the next day to meet demand. And then they will also run a real-time market, also called the balancing market, to ensure real-time balance between demand and supply. They also run other markets, but I'm not getting, gonna get into those uh, today. Basically, both the vertical integrated utility or market operator they use a multi-period optimization model to ensure the intertemporal constraints. And in the case of market operators, they also need to come out with prices. And those prices are usually generated by the optimization models. So let's talk about uh, the main optimization model that's run by uh, vertical integrated utilities and ISOs. And the, the model is called unit commitment. So the unit commitment will determine the least cost way to meet demand. So you need to take into account the technical constraints of the generators like maximum capacity, ramping up and down. We also consider reliability standards. So we need to have some online power capacity or online reserve to account for errors in demand forecast generation and transmission outages, errors in wind and solar power forecasts. These are more like current uh, challenges. The costs include no load costs, like the fixed costs just to keep the generator online, startup and shutdown costs. And there's also some variable costs that could be like fuel costs to power the, the thermal plants or some uh, other costs. And 
side by side with the unit commitment, we have what we call the economic dispatch. So the UC works the same for a market or for a vertically integrated utility. They will find the commitment of each generator on or off, and they will also find the dispatch for each generator. But for market, since we still need to set prices, we also run the model called economic dispatch. The economic dispatch is basically a LP relaxation of the unit commitment problem. So now that I'm saying these, it just makes me realize that maybe you guys are not familiar with the LP relaxation term. So the unit commitment problem is an integer, mixed integer optimization model because you have some integer variables like zero or one, meaning zero, the generator is offline, one, the generator is online, right? So what happens with uh, integer uh, problems is you don't have, uh, okay, maybe we need more <laughs> operations research context here. So when you do the LP relaxation of an integer problem, you're actually allowing these variables that can either be zero or one to take any value between zero or one. That's why we call LP relaxation. So we transform an integer program into a linear program. So we make it easier and faster to solve. And we also gain something called uh, shadow prices. So we get a marginal cost for each one of our constraints. Like if I could eliminate this constraint from my model, how much less it would cost for me to, to generate electricity, just in some uh, high level uh, background. So this marginal cost is also called shadow prices. And when you think about the constraints that will be associated with the transmission system, then we have what we call locational marginal price. So for each bus or for each zone of the system, I have exactly how much it costs to generate an additional megawatt at that zone. So that's what we call LMP, or this is what is used as uh, electricity prices. I wanna make some connections uh, to, to the data analytics and electricity markets uh, before we run out of time. So some current challenges, we all know this, like we are highly dependent on electricity. Think about the whole pandemic we have last year, electricity is what kept us working and kept us connected, right? And we have this huge concern about greenhouse gas emissions because mainly uh, most of the power is still generated by fossil fuels. So the electric power system is undergoing like a major revolution on the supply mix side. We are trying to shift to more renewables and on the decentralization process, which is having more distributed energy resources, having behind the meter generation. So we are introducing new agents to, to the market, if I can say that way. And this major transformation also means like smart sensors, smart meters, IoT-based technology, so more data, right? So the goal here is to transform this information, to transform this additional data from energy systems into insights that improves reliability, resilience, environmental sustainability, affordability, and productivity. So we have two main, five main goals. And the question is, how are we gonna achieve those goals and then the answer is through energy data analytics. So I think we are all in the right place here. So there are a lot of possibilities to improve generation performance, transform customer operations, improve operations, and transform the utility network. So I feel like this connects a lot of the things that, uh, that we talked about and that you guys ask it. And how can we bring that to market? So... There are a lot of uh, things that needs to be addressed when you think about market operations with a high share of renewables. And the first thing that uh, I wanted you guys to, to think about is how do we address this increasing uncertainty and variability 
in the system and the market. So we need forecasting of wind and solar power. There will be huge importance of estimating forecast uncertainty. Uh, we need to start thinking about making the unit commitment problem stochastic because now we have many possible realizations for the, our, our renewable resources. So we want to minimize expected cost across uncertainty. We want, there will be several challenges for real world implementation of these from a computational aspect. It takes much more computational uh, effort to solve a stochastic model than to solve uh, integer or LP model. But most studies show significant benefits of doing that. And we also need improved operating reserve strategies because we have more uncertainty, more intermittence. So we need some new uh, reserve categories. And I want to mention real quick some three, uh, maybe two, I'm not going to try to do the, the three because we are running out of time. But I want to talk a little bit about these first two ongoing research that I have been working on some PhD students at NC State and at my former university in Brazil. So the first one is how we can better coordinate and optimize the resources. So as we have more renewables participating on the market, we need much more decision making and much more optimization techniques. Uh, because the main problem with renewable power is its dependence on natural resources, right? So in Brazil, for example, we have a lot of hydropower, somewhere between 65-70% of our electricity comes from hydro. And the, there is a additional difficulty to operating hydros because we remember I told you we can't store electricity, right? But if we have bigger reservoirs, we can store water that can further be used to generate electricity. So in Brazil, we have like storage capacity that we can coordinate. So our coordination process has a five year horizon because we have a lot of storage capacity in our uh, reservoirs. So the, the problem of the hydrothermal co coordination has, uh, is very important for places with highly dominant renewable generation matrix. Why? So think about this little example here where I have three thermal plants. Imagine I want to dispatch these three to, to supply my demand of 20 megawatts. Of course, I'm just going to do merit order and dispatch from least to uh, most expensive until I meet my demand. Now, think about having a hydro plant with a reservoir. Now, I again need to dispatch these to supply my load of 20 megawatts, but then I have the decision to use all 10 megawatts from the hydro or maybe store some for the next stage. So if I optimize my stage separately, what I'm going to do is I will go to my initial decision of using all my hydro and the other 10 megawatts from my first thermal plant. But when I go to the next stage, it could be that now I don't have any water from my reservoir and I would have to dispatch only thermal plants to meet my 20 megawatt. So this would lead to a total cost of $295. Now, if I optimize my stages together, then you see that the best solution is actually only use five megawatts on the first stage and then the other five on the second stage. And then if I do something like that, I can reduce my cost to 280. So this is just like a simple application and a simple representation to help you guys understand why it's important to have these coordination among stages when we have uh, storage capacity. So uh, like I said, I have a lot of research on how to make these hydrothermal model stochastic, how to build scenarios and try to find the best decision that will minimize the operational cost at present and the expected future. And here's another uh, resource where you can find more information. 
And on another side, we talked a little bit about optimization. I also want to talk about something that uh, I really like working on, which is the forecasting part. So when you have a uh, renewable dominant system, you have a lot of uncertainty regarding generation. So I've been doing a research in terms of the forecasting of the inflows for the hydro system in Brazil. And this is just like a simple representation of what we are doing. So we have here, I don't know if you guys can see my, my cursor, but we have some climate variables here that comes from global climate models like precipitation, humidity, temperature. And then we have rainfall runoff models. We have one that's based on uh, deep learning. We have one that's just a physical model that transforms rainfall into runoff. Actually, we have two of them. And we have here the, the solution. So what's the forecast based on the neural network? What's the forecast based on this physical model with each one of the global climate models as input? And then we have a total of nine chains, as you can see from these blocks here on the bottom of the, of the image. And the question is, what do you do with these nine chains? And in the past, I would answer, find the one that has the least forecasting error and go with that model. But the truth is now there are a lot of talk about combining the predictions of all these different models. So we are actually applying Bayesian model average to these nine chains and trying to come up with a 10 model that is a combination of these nine models. And just to give you an idea of the results, basically what the, the BMA is doing is kind of weighting these nine models. And we have different weights depending on which time of the year we're trying to predict, showing that, yes, that might be a good approach because for some months, the neural networks is the best one. For orders, the physical model is the best one. So definitely combining all these models will lead to better forecasts. And this is being applied to hydro system, but it could be applied to solar, it could be applied to wind, it, it could be applied to demand, it has uh, a wide range uh, of applications.